This vidcast has been made possible by Chris Nell Media and Sound Production. For bookings for voiceover work, on camera, motivational speaking, and DJing at your next event, email info at chrisnell.co.za. To find out more about me, visit my website, chrisnell.co.za. Enjoy today's program. Simon Rennie, welcome to Having a Cup. It's great to have you, son. Chris, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to have a chat with you today. Well, the feeling is mutual, my kind sir. We'll get to your podcast in a moment, which I've listened to. I love it. It's surprising how a lot of people, either from a psychology background, social, uh, you're a social worker, as I'm led to understand, or you have a background as a social worker. Yes, I'm a social worker, yep. They all have wonderful communication skills, which enables them. Or you have someone like me who used to spin records. And I wanted to tell you before we started recording, I'm actually indebted to Australia for producing some of the best talk show hosts. And I'll give you a couple of names. Alan Jones, Ross yes. Stevenson from Melbourne, and then, of course, the all-time great John Laws. <laughs> oh, yes, nice. <laughs> I'm indebted to them for the career that I have today. But before we get to your podcast, tell me a little bit how did you exactly get involved as a social worker and progress on from there to start your own business? Well, it's a long story. How how long have you got? <laughs> More than enough. It's a Monday. Well, More it's still enough. Sunday over there, so but it's a Monday here. So I'm yeah, not yeah. It's, so I guess it started like I developed um, obsessive compulsive disorder when I was eight, and between eight and I'm now thirty nine, I've lived with that, and I've lived with depression, anxiety. I've even experienced burnout in twenty twenty, and a lot. I think when I got to about 16 was when I had my the worst depressive days of my life and I was really down, suicidal ideation, all that type of stuff. Mm. Um, and I said to myself, one day I want to work in a space where I help other people just like me. But it didn't really happen until last year when I or 2018 when I started my social work degree Um and thought after you know starting a career in the public service didn't really want to do that it wasn't filling my cup it was just a job for a job's sake and i thought you know why don't i pursue that career that i wanted when i was about 16 or 17 and so i found social work and loved it and it connected with that uh i guess in, in interior desire to work in the mental health space and and then yes yeah, so i did that part-time having two kids, part-time study, full-time work. Then we had COVID, so we were locked down for a long time here. Ah, and then, don't get yeah, me started last, on that. <laughs> and then last year I finished, and then sorry, this year I've decided to, to hand in that old career that I hated, uh, or didn't hate, but it didn't really fill me, um, fill my needs. And, and What yeah, were you doing before? So I spent, so I kind of went to to uni and I thought, there was two options. One, I can go do visual arts because I loved art and art was a really good way of, of helping me cope with depression at the time oh, and anxiety. It. And then, but I decided to opt for the safer option and doing a generalist degree. I thought, well, I don't know any artists. I don't know how to make a career out of that. I would just go do what everyone else does, get an office job somewhere. And so I did a bachelor of social science. Um, I actually started, I did the first year of psychology in that but it kind, of, it kind of got a bit too hard for me at the time. And then, yeah, I landed in this public service career, so which is basically the federal government here. So I've worked in like the immigration hey. space and multiculturalism. Um, I've worked in sports anti-doping, um, the Australian Border Force, which, you know, it, it's, a, it's one of those sexy careers that you see on TV, but at, at the end of the day, it's a lot of paperwork. Um, and in the last four years, I've worked in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So that's a scheme where we fund people living with disability, their disability supports, which was an amazing job, but right. high, KPI, high KPIs and, and a lot of stress and, and that kind of contributed to the burnout in 2020. So, so yeah, yeah, I kind of I threw that. that in this year and, and, and started my own private practice. Tell me exactly what is the concept behind social work? Because I'm sure a lot of people see the words and then they think to themselves, "At my golly, they go around and telling people what they should do, but they don't look in the mirror and 
uh, they don't have control of their own lives, but I think it's a wide, <laughs> it's a more wider sort of portfolio or profession rather than what people may think. It's more on the line, to my estimation, because I have a couple of friends in that uh, space as well. They analyze and they just surmise and then they offer help. Am I more or less in that, uh, in yeah, the money or what does it entail? It depends if I'm just on what off the kind ball? of field you it depends on what kind of field you're in. Like if you're in the mental health space, I kind of look at social workers in that space as being psychologists, but without the constraints of a, of a clinical room, you know? So we, we kind of do the same type of, like we learn how the mind works. We learn about the, the world and how it operates and how it impacts us as well. So, you know, what's happening over in your part of the world, what's happening in the US, what's happening in, in, in uh, Russia at the moment. All these types of things, we've got climate change, all these types of things, and we conceptualize it, go, okay, how is this impacting the person that we're supporting right in front of us? Um, so, yeah, I, I like to think of it as a bit more freedom than, than psychology, but very similar, particularly when you're working in this mental health space, yeah. Well, I mean, Australia, the last couple of years have had ample reason to be very, very depressed. I mean, you had those bushland fires a couple of years ago, which was worldwide news. Mm. Um, I remember just before Alan Jones retired, he got calls by the dozens from farmers who would literally be screaming, shouting, wailing into the telephone. They're not receiving any help from the, the state. They, their poultry, their livestock went all up in the air because mm -hmm. they either burned to death or their poultry basically passed away because of that enormous drought. There was also that uh, big hubbub with Israel Falau that made that very nasty comment. Jeez, I remember, uh, what's his name? Neil Mitchell, literally tearing him a new one, three yeah. ways to Sunday. So there was a there was a wide, wide variety of, of issues that affects mental health. I mean, I can give you a good example here. When we were in lockdown, businesses closed. I mean, Simon, if I had to tell you, the streets looked like an episode of The Walking Dead empty yeah. just one or two cars parked on either side of the road you didn't hear birds chirp there was no screaming no shouting no kids playing nothing yeah but uh, <laughs> an, another thing that i think which puts you in a class of your own is the fact that you combat that wonderful saying men don't tell mm, yes definitely and that's what i love about social work is is challenging those social constructions of what it means to be a man mm. and i and i and i think back to when i first developed the the signs of ocd when i was about eight so I was probably around the same age and i grew up in a working class area um northern suburbs of adelaide south australia um i played football so australian rules football mm -hmm. um, i had three brothers in the household plus dad so we had a very testosterone driven or masculine household mm -hmm. and you know, when you're playing football, which is similar to rugby or similar to other like physical sports, it's right. If you get hit, you, you expect to get hit and you expect to get hurt. And the, the thing is, you, you you pick yourself up, up, dust yourself off and off you go again. You don't dwell on it. You don't uh, cry or anything like that. And for me, that was a real challenge because I was a bit, you know, I, I'm a little bit sensitive. I'm a sensitive guy. As am but I. For, so it, it kind of like conditioned us the footy field and then you, you take that into the home as well. And it, it's, and it, it is what you said, like boys need to suck it up. Boys need to harden up. Boys need to be tough, be men. What it is to be a man is to be all these things. And I remember at school one day, you know, I'm eight or nine years old and, and my best mate, he was crying in the schoolyard. And I went up to him and I said, mate, you've got to stop crying. And he said, why is that? And he said, well, I know you're upset, but boys don't cry. And out here I am at eight, nine, ten years old, and I'm saying the things that I've been socially conditioned to believe. And he looked me in the eye and said, Simon, I can cry if I want to. And that planted like a little seed in me that stuck around, you know, I'm 39 now, and I still think about that moment. And it questioned everything that I'd learned on the footy field or at home or anything about what it is to be a guy and what it means to be a man. And, and that well, if my friend can cry, my best mate can cry, and he said it's okay, then maybe I could do the same. Mm. So that stuck with me for a very long time. But what I actually did was I reverted back to that social construction of being trying to be tough, and I bottled it up for 20 years. 
I didn't talk about it. I had I had like a diary. I remember in, in high school I had this diary that I'd write some really dark poetry in. Um, and I think that was pretty much the only visible signs that people would see that I was struggling with something. But I didn't know what it was, what what mental health was in the 90s and early 2000s. Nobody talked about it. Um, and so, yeah, I bottled it up and it wasn't until 10 years ago, actually. So in my late 20s, when my wife said, Simon, like our relationship's hurting the way that you are, because I was being a bit nasty and and not quite myself, not the person that she fell in love with. And, and she said, you need to go and talk to someone about, about what's going on. So, and I think at the point I was, for, for a few years before that, I kind of dusted it off and said, no, nah, everything's okay. I'm all right. I'll get through this. But I wasn't getting through it and I wasn't all right. I was drinking a lot, trying to, to numb the pain or numb the th- excessive thought cycles that go through my head. And it got to a point where the pain of, of staying the same, to quote Tony Robbins, was was greater than the pain of change. And so I walked into that GP that 10 years ago. What's that, sorry? Love that quote. Oh, it's beautiful. And 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 it's so true. Like we 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 stick on autopilot we until do. that point when we actually need to, we realize like, geez, the, 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 how I'm showing up today and, and for the last 10 years isn't the kind of person I want to be. Mm. And so... Going into that GP's office and saying, I think I've got mental health issues was one of the hardest things I've ever had to say. True. And and I nearly choked on the words as they came out. And then, but after that, things slowly got started getting better. I was able to get a referral to a psychologist. And and that's where my formal diagnosis came through of, of, oh, Simon, you've been living with OCD since you're about eight years old. Um, You know, judging them based on what the symptoms that I was describing and, and stuff like that. Um, but also, yeah, depression and anxiety, they're sitting in there as well. And we've got to work through that. So I went on, did a whole bunch of therapy and I've, you know, went on meds and, and, and just started this, this process of recovery. And, and it's 10 years ago, 10 years today, uh, this year. And, and I've seen psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and counselors try different styles of therapy. I, I'm really into mindfulness and that's where the mindful men mm. stuff comes from a podcast mm. and in my business as well. And, and yeah, it's it's a it's a roller coaster ride, but it's something that I'm really passionate about helping other people to talk about because at first it was hard for me, but the more I do it, the easier it gets. Correct. I have to commend you on that. Simon, if I may focus on the men gender exclusively, mm-hmm. I have to agree with you, and you mentioned it yourself. Men don't talk. You know, if you fall, scrape your knee, oh, get up, dust yourself off, carry on. And especially in a testosterone household where, I'm going to use a nasty word, gender abuse is commonplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, we as men bury it in the, the caverns of our souls until eventually, like with what happened to you, it ultimately boils over to the top, alcoholism, suicide, worst case scenario, depression, and GBV ultimately become the order of the day. and. Yep. I don't want to move this into a socioeconomic issue, but I will. I'd like to think as well, for many years, starting from the earliest days from the 21st century up until now, there's been a war on masculinity in, in the other, in the sense of we're not being who we are meant to be. Yes, you're absolutely right. We do have tear ducts. We have to cry. But there also comes a time where we have to tap into our resource, which is natural leadership, equal to extreme ownership in order to be all that we can be and going against the grain of, you know what, I'm not meant for being sitting in a in an office from nine to five every given day, come home very tired, don't have time to play with my kids, don't have time to give, pay attention to my wife. Bullshit. That all has to change. Yeah, definitely. And, and you raise a great, you know, just suicide alone, if you look at the suicide stats, so eight, eight Australians die by suicide each day. And 75% of those are male. You know, it's a leading cause of death in Australians between 15 and 44, which is just phenomenal. Like, it's shocking. But then you also you talk about you know, gender-based violence. And, 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 and over here, like, our data shows that men are perpetrators. They're, they're overwhelmingly the perpetrators of family and domestic violence to kids and to partners. Um, and I think it comes down to this, this nature that guys... Sh- shouldn't talk and 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 it's weak to speak and and so forth but if we can we can you know 
shake it out of the guys and say it isn't weak to speak is actually okay and and things get better like if you've got a, a healthy outlet to to release some of this pain mm. or anger or trauma or whatever it is without judgment you, yeah that's right without judgment then you're not going home and beating up your kids or your wife or your partner or or you're not thinking about suicide or anything like that um you know there is help out there there's people that are trained to, to work in this space and 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 what I hope to do with Mindful Men is inspire guys to talk and, and, and show them just by sharing my story. And it's just an, I call it like an average Joe story. It's not, it's not profound. It's not, I don't have suicide stories to tell or near death experiences to tell. Um, I'm just an average bloke where I perceive that my mental illness is just average. It's, it's nothing too crazy. But then when I actually talk about it, it sounds really crazy and it sounds really full on, but you know, and if other guys can go, hey, Simon's doing it, I can do it too, then of that's course. what I'm here for. That's what I'm trying to do. And, and that's why I love being on shows like yourself, Chris, like yours, Chris, and um, sharing this because, it, you know, recovery is possible and, and mental health is a good thing. Having and talking about it is a good thing. Absolutely. And we can be productive members of society. We can be greater uh, partners to our loved ones and we can be even greater parents. You know, Simon... Yes. I have to tell you, that's one of my biggest dreams is to be, um, I'm not married yet and I don't have kids, but I certainly want both. But I'm glad that it didn't come at the time where I myself was still struggling with alcohol and drugs and and um, still struggling with cancer and that. Because you learn life lessons, you would agree with me. From all those experiences, you get life lessons and you put those life lessons yes. under your belt. And with those life lessons, they arm you, they give you your armor so that when a certain situation of similar caliber arises, you're more geared to tackle it head on with more proactivity, but then also in partnership, in concert with your familial structure, with your partner. You would agree with me on that? Oh, 100%. And, and there's so many guys in this space that I talk to that say, I'm I'm doing what I'm doing now. I'm advocating like I'm advocating now because I kind of want to be that person that I didn't have 10 or 20 years ago when I was growing up. That role model who could say, Simon, it's okay to be not okay. Um, now, this is nothing against my, my dad or anything like that, but I just don't know if he knew how to talk about that stuff. And I doubt that Naturally. even today he knows how to talk about that. It's nothing personal against him. It's just that that's how, that's his generation. Um, mm, so now as a mm, dad I myself, agree. I'm like, I'm like, I've, okay, I've gone through this for 30 years and now I've got two kids, two beautiful kids. And the last thing I want for them is them to develop mental illness. But at the same time, like, I'm going to be there for them and we're going to have these open conversations. Um, they're really into the mindful men. I, my little boy got his, his mindful men t-shirt in the mail today, so he loves it. So by just even doing stuff like that and involving him in the business, just talking about it, that starts to normalize it for them so that when they're 15 or 25 or 35 or whatever, they go, oh, dad did this. I can do this. You know, if dad can do it, I can do it. Kind of like when I learned to drive and I thought, well, if my mum can drive, I can drive. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? There's nothing wrong with men as well looking up to their mums for being inspiration. Yes. You know, yes. I'm going to be yes. transparent. My my, uh, my dad walked out on me and my mum when I just finished college. And, you know, when I went into recovery for myself after a, 10 years of solid alcohol and drug abuse, you know, you have to be transparent. And you have yeah. to look in the in the mirror and you have to say, you know what, me ma played a big role in my recovery. And throughout the course of my life, no matter how much trouble I put her through and how much drama I put her through, she was always there for me and she still supported me every given step of the way. There's nothing yeah, wrong definitely. with that. But I have to admit this. You will agree with me that a son goes to their father to get his courage. A daughter mm -hmm. goes to their mum to get their identity. Right? Yes, I love that. But then again, I think there's a special badge of honor to be made for parents who actually pull dual roles. Not, yeah. not often because they want to, but often because the circumstances dictate that they should. And you know what? That, uh, that, is, that is something. That is something I really have to say. That is something. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and I like that, you know, that we need to embrace those female, I guess, role models in our lives. And, 
and through mindful men that's why i love chatting with both men and women and and then people that don't identify with either gender as well is because when we look at the world through different lenses and this is i guess the social worker coming out of me different perspectives whether it's um perhaps you know cultural perspectives or gender-based perspectives religious perspectives we can start to see the world in different ways and start to go okay how does that impact me in terms of the way I think and feel and believe and, and, and see the world as well? The same with our kids. I had, I had my son Gus on the podcast just to hear his thoughts about random things. And, and now he's keen to do another one. And, and oh, you know, man. even our kids can teach us so much about the world because we're always on autopilot as parents and adults <laughs> to just kind of, you know, do the hustle, the daily grind, but the kids are like staring up and looking at the beauty of the world and, and so forth. So, by, by looking at these different role models, whether regardless of gender or, or whatever, um, they're really insightful ways to become mindful of who we are. And that's the, the second component of mindful men. It's, mm. it's two components. It's mindful of who we are in different parts of our lives, but it's also mindfulness-based practice in terms of how we can ground ourselves and be present in the moment and use that to overcome things like anxiety or depression or, or obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. Now, tell me, how exactly do you apply mindfulness and how do you promote it? Take, teach me some techniques. Yeah, so I I like to, to teach what I've been taught myself or what I've gone through myself through my own therapy. And, and I was introduced to acceptance and commitment therapy through my social work, but I've also, I didn't realize that I'd been also having this applied to me in my own therapy over the years as well. And, and there's a few things that make acceptance and commitment therapy what it is and and one of it is tuning into our values so what do we value in life and and what do we value in the people around us so that's one component and then using those values for for goal setting and and trying to overcome trauma or or you know, mental illness more generally but there's also it's it's some easy strategies to to deal with things like anxiety for example so i experienced a lot of anxiety through through, through my work career and relationships and just socially as well. Um, so some great tips that I've used and I've learned is, is around how to be present in the moment because my mind will wander 500 different ways every second. And so for me, it's a real struggle to be present um, with my kids in front of me. They might be talking to me, but I'm on a different planet. Uh, my wife, the same. Um, in workplaces, I'm, it's the same as well. Even in the car, like I would literally drive from A to B and not remember the car ride because I've been thinking about so many other things. So one way to be present is I always like to remind myself, just be where my feet are. And it's kind of like this grounding com concept. You ground yourself on the, on the ground. Um, and I like to use this actually outside. So I like to go for a walk. And if I'm not concentrate, if I don't realize that I'm walking on a walk or running, I might brush my hand along a tree or something like that or grab some leaves in my hand and crunch them and actually just mindfully feel what I'm doing, feel the, the roughness of the leaves or the crunch in my hand. Um, another great one I love to use is if, particularly if I'm sitting, is looking at trees. And it's great if it's a windy, a slightly windy day because you can look at the trees and the leaves on that and see how the, the greenness of the leaves changes depending on where shadow is and, and how much the wind's going. And, it, a, it's beautiful to look at, but B, it just concentrates the, the mind on one thing. It doesn't, you're not thinking about the deadline that you missed or going out with your mates afterwards. You're actually just thinking that tree is just doing this amazing thing right now with the wind. And it sounds really wanky and it sounds really hippie. No, it doesn't. But it, really do, it really does work. And, and a, well, a lot of guys think so. And, it, and I even thought about that the same when I started. I'm like, man, I'm not doing this. But then the, when I did it, I'm like, oh, this actually works. Like there's some actual benefit to doing this. Um, I've tried meditation. My mind, I think, races too much for meditation. Yeah, but what I did find too. is, what I did find is this, there's some great YouTube clips and it's, it's actually called brain training, which is a form of medication. Of meditation. And what happens, so that they'll have like, four or five different sounds playing at once. So you could have like a cowbell, a running water, um, a bird chirping and so on. And what it does is it guides you through listening to this for five or 10 minutes, but it tells you, okay, now focus on the bell. Now focus on the bird. Now focus on the water. 
And by doing that, what you're training your, your brain to do is to focus on one thing amidst all the chaos of the other noises as well. And so that's a really good way to, I find, to meditate as opposed to try, trying to slow the mind. I'm trying to train the mind, um, which is a great tip, um, which actually helped me. I did men's yoga for a while. And what I'd find is I would walk into a session and my brain would be doing what it's what it naturally does. And but by about the two thirds of the way through, I would I would all of a sudden be like kind of just one with the moment. Like I'm into the move, I'm focused on my breath, and then everything else just stop. I stop thinking about everything else because I'm, I'm I've, my brain has gone from five hundred things to just the one or two things that I'm doing in that room. So. These things take a lot of practice and the more you do it, the easier it gets, but it, they're so good to do. And, and, and that's what I love about. And so, so yeah, that's where the kind of mindfulness came or started for me. was just tuning into these types of practices. While you're busy talking, you're going to like this. Um, my friend who helped me combat cancer and I went through a natural route mentioned yep. something in the oncologist's office. It's springtime and I'm sure it's also starting to become springtime in Australia. Yes where uh, it's actually vital to, and here's the important component, to walk barefoot and actually ground yourself in the grass because your feet absorb the natural nutrients which actually yeah. energizes the body. That's why I said what you mentioned with regards to the trees, the leaves blowing and whatnot, it's not hippy-dippy. Yeah. It's actually vital because you're connecting in the moment with the algorithm of the Earth's yes. circumference. And beyond yeah. that, what you've just mentioned with the leaves blowing uh, of the trees and whatnot, that's actually an artist's eye for when they should paint a landscape. That's how they oh. become present. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a why I used to love, maybe that's why I used to love drawing landscapes. Maybe. I don't well, know. <laughs> there we've answered it for you, my good squire. There we go. <laughs> but uh, tell me, what has the success rate been since you've started Mindful Men and how many people have come to you? and said, listen, I'm struggling with this. And the, over, the underlying causes, I'm guessing, has been majority anxiety or they've come from a bad family background. Take me a little bit into that. Yeah, so it's only a relatively new business. So I've only been doing this, the practice itself this year. Um, but it, during my social work degree, we have to do placements in, in, a, in an agency. And I did one in a private practice. Because A, I was interested in learning business, but also I wanted to to apply my therapy skills. And so I had uh, a 99% caseload of guys, most, mostly between, oh, that would have been between 10 and 60 or so, roughly. Um, there, there was a lot of depression. There was a lot of, um, a lot of identity, like not knowing who they were, like, you know, whether or not they were parents or, or you know, in terms of a disability perspective, I was working with, with a couple of people with disability, um, but a lot of it was identity and that was the clear thing that came out and whether or not that identity challenge was with, amidst a relationship breakdown or a family and domestic violence situation or or a new relationship, like, you know, trying to, to work out ways to to engage best with their, their one guy's partner and so forth, but identity kept coming through. It's and that's why I turned to values-based work. We, we could tune into those values and go, okay, you're feeling lost. You're feeling like you've lost your identity or you don't know who you are. Let's look at our values first and then work out a strategy from there. And then every time we did some sort of new task, we would reflect on, okay, how does this relate back to our values? You know, values around respect or trust or love or honesty, all these types of things. And from there, we were able to build up a bit of a, an identity from the from the ground up and I did this with every guy that I worked with and what I found was some guys I was able to help them through and and successfully discharge them from the service you know I'm doing this as a, a mature age student but you know I think I was so good at it was because I'd lived with it for 30 years mm. you know I'd lived through I've walked in the same shoes I knew what it mean I know what it feels like as a guy to feel a bit lost Am I being masculine enough? Am I the right? Am I the best parent, or the best husband, or the best son? Or, you know, I had this career before. Like, why am I climbing the ladder? Like, I I know what this feels like, and I and I know how it feels like in amidst depression, anxiety, and OCD. 
Um, so yeah, by just doing that, we were able to discharge a few guys. A few guys wanted to keep working with me. One of those guys is still working with me today in my new practice, which is fantastic. Um, but also they share their story and their journey with other people as well. So then I get phone calls from other people saying, Simon, you know, you spoke to Joe Bloggs, can you work with me? I'm like, and, and, and we'll just go with it. But at the end of the day, it's also about the right fit. So I'm not going to be the right fit for everybody. Um, and if I start talking to someone or they start talking to me and it's just not gelling, then we just be honest with each other and we do a referral to somebody else because there's nothing worse than being in therapy with the person on the other side you just don't gel with. No, absolutely. I have to agree with you. You know, there's no such thing as one size fits all. Tell no. me, since you've now realized your OCD, you're prone to anxiety and depression, you've actually taken uh, steps to better yourself and try to help yourself heal. How's your self-image improved and how has your role as a dad and a partner, as a husband, how's that improved over the last while? Um, I think the biggest thing for me is knowing when I'm not okay. You know, so even though I do this and, and this is why I often refer to mental health as a roller coaster. So there's days where you're fantastic, you're flying, you're loving life. And then there's days where you're plummeting down to the earth of feeling like you're about to smack into the ground. And because I've been through this journey and I know that it's okay to speak up, I think for me, it's just recognizing and my family recognizing when I'm not doing well and I go straight to the doctor. I go, things aren't working. Do I need to look at my meds? Do I need to go back to counseling? Do I need to try something? But before I even get to that, I can look at, okay, am I drinking too much at the moment? Am I drinking too much beer? Um, Cause I still do that. Uh, you know, um, am I eating right? Often not when I'm feeling crap and I'm not, I'm not eating right. I'm maybe not exercising. I'm not doing the basics first. And then, yeah, if I need a bit of extra help, I can go and, and, and get that from a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker or whatever. And, but I think, yeah, it's just tuning into that. And, and particularly with my, with my son, like we, we do butt heads sometimes, but we're both pretty vulnerable with each other and and in the family as well so i think if i can just keep doing that with him and and keep showing him that it's okay to butt heads but still you know get vulnerable and cry and and upset but then recover you know i think that's going to make me feel really good as a dad going growing up because mm. it was kind of the thing i didn't have with my dad so mm. Mm. so yeah and, and it's a journey like you know and and parenting space like we often, parents try to be perfect. We try to be the perfect parent. We try never to get angry or upset or, you know, but there's a concept in parenting. It's more good enough parenting as opposed to par perfect parenting. Mm. Our kids don't need us to be perfect. They need us to be present and they need us to be good enough and trying and, and right. recognizing that we might have stuffed up or recognizing that, you know, we can do better. And then, and then every day we just try to be a bit better. That's, that's all parenting is in the, at the end. Um, but a lot of us parents get so hung up on being perfect and not, and I think that's where, you know, bottling it up comes into it as well. Like we try, we bottle it up. We don't want to show our kids that we're, we're weak or, or feminine or, or not masculine and all that, but that's just pointless <laughs> in 2022. It it's pointless. And, and we just, we want to show our kids that it's okay to be not okay. And, and that we're not perfect. And cause life isn't perfect. Um, no. perfect, perfectionism has been something that I, I've struggled with through my OCD. So in order to, to alleviate a lot of the anxieties associated with OCD, I would need things to be perfect in lots of different facets of my life, whether or not it's how I lock the house up at nighttime to keep us safe. Even like at work, you know, did I write the perfect email so that the person on the other end doesn't get offended with something that is a, a standard business communication? Mm. Because the OCD in me, that. and this is and this is where the OCD gets a bit weird, is when I click send on my on my emails, my OCD tells me, Simon, did you write that right? Because all of a sudden there's swear words in there, or it's changed, you know. And it's it is such a weird thing, and it's like that that can't even happen, can it? <laughs> like it can happen, but, I, but at the most but then uncomfortable I moment. <laughs> Yeah, but then I check and check and check and check and check and with this whole idea that I need to be perfect. And what I'm coming to realize is this, and, and it, it actually forms part of my um, practice framework for social work. I got introduced to this concept called wabi-sabi. 
and it's around the beauty and imperfection. It's a Japanese, um, oh, like design thing. Like, like you, you purposely, you, you draw into. Also, let me this example. So you break a vase, and it mm-hmm. was a beautiful vase as it was, but then you put it back together with gold thread, and then it becomes something new and something even more beautiful. And so it's appreciating that life is fragile but also that it can be rebuilt and repurposed in different ways. So, you know, this, this concept comes out in, in architecture. It comes out in garden design. Calligraphy, um, great, I wanted to say, yeah. Yeah, there's a great, um, oh, there's a great like little story I learned with Wabi Sabi. It was around this garden, this gardener, and he was teaching students how to, how to do the perfect garden or do a garden that looked really cool. And, so they they spent a day cleaning up this garden and showing the teacher what a perfect garden would look like and he said this is not perfect and so and they were like what do you mean like there's no leaves on the ground everything's in place Every, the grass is nicely cut and then he went up and shook a tree and the leaves fell down and he said now it's perfect because it's real this is what life is like there's leaves on the ground there's you know the grass is there there's smells everything it's this is perfect now and so it's this 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 uh, love for the imperfection or the beauty and imperfection, and that's where that's what life is. It's imperfect, so we need to drop drop this concept around trying to be perfect, myself included, and I really struggle with it. Um, but yeah, embrace the imperfect because um, there's beauty in it. Absolutely, you know Ed O'Neill himself, who you'll remember from uh, Married with Children and uh, Modern yes. Family. Yeah said that uh, being a dad is not about there's no there's no guideline there's no guideline on being a dad no 99 <laughs> percent of the time it's just showing up yeah tell me about your podcast the mindful men podcast i've listened to an episode here and there and i absolutely love yeah. it you're a talented monologist <laughs> thank you well it, the podcast come about uh, as an extension of mindful men so 2020 i went through burnout and I ended up having to take four months off of work. Uh, I just Ouch. I couldn't function. I just couldn't function. I couldn't think straight. I was in a really bad spot. And so I took that time off and I spent time actually reconnecting with the creative side of me. And I, in a weird, a roundabout way, I, I've, got a, I've got a MacBook um, computer and on there's GarageBand, the, this, yeah. this uh, music platform where you can, and I, for, I've never, I've played guitar, but like, I never was a DJ or anything like that, but I, I always liked this idea of, of looping music together. I, I love watching those YouTube clips where they, they loop and like little guitar, little riffs and so forth. So anyway, I started doing um, this as a bit of a mindfulness practice because my brain was like all over the place, but by sitting down for an hour and just looping random tracks together to make some sort of a song, and mm. then it, it helped me just focus and it was creative. And then I forced myself to press publish onto YouTube. And I thought, you know, no one's ever going to listen, watch this, or listen to this. This is not going to make me millions of dollars or anything like that. But it was a creative process of just building something and then, and then publishing it and releasing it to the world. And so I started doing that. And then I developed my Instagram account, for, so Mindful Men on Instagram where I was kind of taking it to the next level and doing daily affirmations. So trying to pet myself up with little sayings like, you know, everything will be okay. I've got that in the, in the little blackboard behind me. And um, so I did that. And the more and more I just did this type of stuff, other people started coming along for the ride and, and, and similar people in my space, men who just wanted to talk or they're like, Oh, Simon, this is so useful for men. And then, the start of this year, I was like, okay, I've been doing that for a year or so. And then where can I take it next? So I thought, oh, let's do podcasts. Cause I was using podcasts as a medium to, to hear other people tell their stories. And, right. and also it gave me inspiration. So I'm like, oh, I can do a podcast. Um, so yeah, I just started telling my story on the podcast as well, trying to get to more people because not everyone's on Instagram or YouTube. Sure. And then, and yeah, so I started telling a bit about my story and then, I put it out to the world. You know, like, does anyone want to come on as a guest? And uh, all of a sudden I had all these people saying, yeah, I'd love to share my story. And, and so that's where we've gone and, and every week. And this is why I like to do the guests with all over the world as well. It's like, and you know, men and women is so that we can see the, the world through different perspectives and of different course. lenses. 
and talk about different topics like the like you know i've had gus on the show and we talked about going to the zoo and then last week i had a a forensic psychologist who'd worked in u.s prisons um you know it's such a diverse you know i've had people on there talking about dogs and and how they can be used to heal us um True. And talk about pat- patriarchy. I've talked about masculinity. I talk about you know growing up playing footy and 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 all this type of stuff and how that influenced my identity. Um, but yeah, just I just talk about completely stuff that it seems random, but it all comes back to helping guys particularly become mindful of who they are because they might go, yeah, I had a similar experience to that, or maybe I've been in a prison in the U- United States, or. Or maybe I I did use my dog for therapy a therapy process or or whatever and just realize that the in the world that they're not alone because in mental illness we think that we are the only people in the world experiencing that particular condition. Mm. So OCD, for example, OCD is called the silent condition. It takes about fifteen or seventeen years on average to from first symptom to first treatment because you feel like man, I'm so weird that I think like this and you don't want to tell anybody because some of it's really scary. And some of it, like, you know, I was talking to one guy, uh, a therapist in, in in Chicago about OCD and he was telling me about there's some really scary versions of OCD like pedophilia OCD. Oh, you know, no. so for a parent, you know, for a parent, you you, it's natural thing for a parent to take their kid to a public toilet, right? Right. You know, you're at, a, you're at a playground and they go, oh, dad, I've got to go to the toilet. So you, you take them to the toilet. You don't think about it. Someone with a pedophilia OCD, the obsessive thought might come in that everybody in the park is watching them take a child to the toilet and oh. then thinking they're a pedophile. Oh. So then the compulsive act is that you might, Ouch. you might avoid taking your kids to the toilet and get your partner to do that or take the, wait and tell them to, to hold on until we get home so that, nobody would think that you're a pedophile it's not that you're a pedophile or no, that you have all. that tendency but it and this is how ocd can be so so weird i mean i don't have that particular version of ocd but there are people out there that do and or you've got harm ocd so if you're holding a knife and you're cooking a, uh, you're you're cutting up vegetables at dinner time and then all of a sudden you get this obsessive thought like what if i accidentally stab someone like your kid or your partner mm. Right. And it's not that you want to do it. It's just that it comes into your mind. So then, you, so that's the obsessive component of it. So then the compulsion is that you stop touching knives. Right, you know? right, right. But right, how are you right. ever going to cook a meal if you can't pick up a knife? Of course. You know? so because you continuously it's, it's, think of yourself as accident prone. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's what the OCD world is. It's like something that I'm going to do. Like for me, for, for me, one of them is when I leave the car, the handbrake has to be on really tight. Otherwise it's going to roll down and kill a whole bunch of people down a hill. (sighs) So I would obsessively think about that. So when I get out the car and I walk away, I'm, I particularly when I was younger and learning to drive, I would walk back. Even if I've walked 20 minutes away, I would walk back to check that car is still stable and that the ham, it, it probably looks like I'm breaking into my car half the time, but I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how weird it is. Like, no, so, sure, so sure, sure. I'm laughing with you in solidarity. I'm not laughing yeah, at you. Yes. Oh, I laugh at it all the time because when you say OCD things out so loud, they sound stupid. But in your mind, in the person that lives with OCD, it is so real. It is so like life and death. In, inside your mind but when you say it out and this is i guess another another mindfulness practice is when we we say it out loud or we write it down on a piece of paper it's no longer in our heads it's out in the world and we then it has less power over us right you know? and then right. we can take control back over our anxiety so so the podcast in you know, long story you know trying to wind that story because i tend to go down a few rabbit holes. Ah, please <laughs> so carry on mike carry on is 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 particularly ocd is like oh wow for 15 years i have not i have been thinking these things and i didn't realize that i'm not a freak maybe i have ocd so people might you know hopefully through the podcast and through the instagram and all that i can inspire other people to go oh you know i do this checking weird checking thing as well or or or, yeah i'm getting these thoughts about public toilets and my kids and geez maybe i can go get some help for it and and the beauty about it is that help is available. Help is out there. Recovery is possible. 
And when you go into a therapist's office who's experienced in things like OCD or depression, anxiety, or whatever, they've heard a lot of these stories before. So we're sure. not alone. We're not the only person in the world experiencing this stuff. And yeah, that's what I hope to achieve with the podcast. Well, you know what, Simon, bringing it all to a close, I have really, first of all, have to congratulate you because you seem like an extremely laconic guy and not just you being laconic, you've actually used your test and you've turned it into a testimony to help others. And you're the living embodiment. And I said this before to a couple of people as well. If you have someone who has book knowledge exclusively, they come from a clinical angle. But if you take someone who has lived experience along with book knowledge and you bring those together, you've got a lethal weapon at hand that will prove absolutely um, the benefit rather than the deficit in order to leaving yeah. the earth one day a little bit better than what we originally received it. Simon Rennie, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. If you would like to follow Simon's uh, work, you can check out uh, Mindful Men on Instagram. What is that handle for yep. Instagram, uh, Simon? Yeah, it's mindful.men.aus on both Facebook and Instagram. And check out the Mindful Men podcast. It airs on Apple Podcasts. It airs on Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. There's solo podcasts. There's interviews. And trust me, this man will absolutely captivate you with the amount of knowledge that he has. Simon, nothing but the blessed. Carry on the good fight, my kind sir. Chris, thanks so much for having me, mate. I really enjoyed this, this chat and I hope to do it again sometime. You're more than welcome. So it is here where we have to make a pit stop, but don't fret, we'll be back soon. In the meantime, tell your friends, join us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and Podcast One. Until we see you again, this was Having a Cuppa for the Week. See you soon.